Today, we might actually now have the business model of how Tesla might partner with other automakers. We've seen Elon Musk repeatedly promote that other OEMs should license Tesla's full self-driving technology, but we haven't yet heard how he's thinking of how much Tesla should charge them. Well, he's now shared one option. Apparently, Elon's perfectly fine with offering the technology either free or just at cost to other companies. This has triggered a lot of debate happening among the Tesla investors, and as a bonus today, we're going to also review whether Tesla has a moat in self-driving. Is this something many others are or will be able to do? Do companies like the Chinese electric vehicle makers, Mobileye, NVIDIA, Cruise, Waymo, do they have a chance? We've got Larry Goldberg with us. Uh, he's a multi-entrepreneur and he's got a lot of thoughts on this. This is a big topic. Thank you so much, Larry. I appreciate you joining me on this one. Thank you, Herbert. Just, we should say, I'm not at home. I'm in Amsterdam enjoying the Tesla community here and uh, surroundings are not quite my normal. I love love what you're doing. You travel the US, now you're traveling the world. You've got your cyber truck. <laughs> you're passing out full self-driving and I appreciate you joining us with it, your the cyber truck. The cyber truck didn't fit on the plane. <laughs> it's too big. Yeah, otherwise yeah. you would have taken it with you. All right, so a couple points here, and then let's walk it through what Elon is now saying about full self driving. So first of all, this happened yesterday, two days ago. Omar from Homar's catalog said, "In the future, every car will be self driving and electric. Every car Tesla makes is self driving and electric, and they're the world leader in EV sales. And then as robot cars eat the auto market, Tesla will be the overwhelming benefactor." This idea that there should be both self-driving and electric is not enough. If you're an automaker to make electric vehicles, few are able to get profit on that, but they also have to do self-driving. Otherwise, they're not going to do, they're just going to be dead in the water. Elon said, yeah, should be obvious. Then he quickly replied, in addition, a new comment, and he said, and we will license the tech to other car companies. Now, this is not new. He's been talking about licensing the tech. This one is new. So this morning, Omar said this, FSE licensing, here's his proposal. First of all, allow these automakers to integrate into any car for free or at cost. So don't, Tesla doesn't have to charge the OEM to implement this. The car owner pays for the FSE license. Now, of course, active safety and the basics should be free anyways. But then he, and then the other option is to leverage the supercharger deals. So if the OEM partners with Tesla for FSE licensing, they can get the, uh, the customers can get the, the same pricing on supercharger as the Tesla car owners do. Elon then replied, Tesla would be happy to do such deals. What do you think about this? This has caused quite a bit of debate among the Tesla investors, whether or not you should give it away for free or at cost. What's your thoughts? You know, Holmar's finally earned, earned his spurs. I mean, kudos to him. What a great business model and what a great solution. Firstly, this is not giving away anything. This is really the same deal as the supercharger deal. Look, I'm here in Amsterdam. I just supercharged last, my Tesla last night. At the supercharger, about a third of the cars were non-Teslas. Those guys were paying Tesla for their kilowatt hours. They were paying them for the kilowatts. That Tesla was making money. And that supercharger, which was going, okay, was doing okay, was doing fair business, now is doing land office business. And the margins at that peak are extraordinarily good. So that's the same with FSD. If the customers pay the money and Tesla gets the cash or the margin on that FSD, then both the OEM and Tesla are rewarded. And who pays? The customer, which is fair. So there's no tax on the OEM. There's no upfront fee or some relatively modest up some upfront fee. But the customer pays. The OEM makes money. Tesla makes money. Ideal, ideal business model. Great job, Paul Mars. Well, okay. So the debate that other people are saying is, okay, Tesla spent a ton of money, of course. You know, on training, <laughs> the R&D, they've been doing it for eight plus years to be able to create self-driving. They could wipe out 
that's uh, everyone else out there. Now, clearly there's data too, right? So this, this idea that if you partner with all these other companies, the automakers, you're going to get more data, more cars, and that's going to just solidify your lead. And then once you turn on RoboTaxi, then you've basically become the big player. It's hard for other players to come in. Um, what's, what are, what, why would some people want to be paid for, you know, like stop giving it away. That's some of the investors feeling is that they're giving it away to these uh, other car companies. Well, firstly, if investors really believe that if Tesla withholds licensing from these other OEMs, these other OEMs are just going to go away and they're going to, you know, melt in away as the, you know, spring snow, not going to happen. There is going to be such strong incentive and such strong necessity that firstly, there's real danger that governments will step in. There's real danger that monopoly issues will arise. And there's real danger that these are, and there's reality that these other companies are going to start so solving the problem, which they are going to do anyway. And it's just a matter of time. So there's every incentive for Tesla to share the reward and earn, you know, the, the money. I mean, listen, it is a given in the software business that if you can do it in software, somebody else can do it. Now, it may take them longer. They may not be as satisfactory, or they may even find a way to do it better. License them, share the reward. You're going to only win. I've been in situations, and not that long ago, I've been in situations where people thought, oh, we have the monopoly, we're going we're gonna to eat well tonight. I've seen that power absolutely melt away. Mm -hmm. And so it's crazy to think you can, earn, you can own a monopoly when software is involved, it's almost impossible yeah almost. this is different right this is not just software it's amount of data in the second half of this show we'll cover the moat that tesla has in self-driving compared to all these other companies um we'll, we'll do that in detail but so right now right this partnership i i get you right obviously if you've got a lead it makes the most sense to, to license this and you know that elon no, has been talking about this yeah. i mean you know tesla can double triple or quadruple its exposure of FSD to the marketplace by simply allowing these, uh, about licensing it out to these companies. And it doesn't, Tesla won't earn money from these companies with multi million dollar upfront payment deals. Where right. they'll really it's, earn money is, yeah. you know, that license fee over time coming from the drivers. Yeah. And standardizing it as, you know, the world standard, which would it's be- the standard. That's the critical thing, right? So, so uh, I did a whole show with CERN Basher, who did a whole business model, financial model on RoboTaxi. And the economics are so lucrative Very for good. the RoboTaxi provider for Tesla, $100,000 per year, per car in perpetuity. <laughs> so you would, and eventually there's no reason for you to sell the car. And so this thing about getting an F, it's not just the FSD, let's say, oh, the customer's gonna pay you $12,000 per, it's uh that's the initial amount. Eventually these will turn into robo taxis and then that's where the real dollars come and it, they'll probably share that with the automaker, but mm -hmm. it's so lucrative. It is so lucrative that it's just ridiculous to too blind about, oh, I should make some licensing deal first. Yeah. Personally, I, I don't subscribe to these naive views that, you know, you can, you can build these monopolies and build these massive moats and this massive flow of money it doesn't happen because ultimately if you do succeed at it the government's going to step in ask andrew right. Carnegie. he's not a, he's not available to ask right now but if you look at <laughs> his yeah you'll see that it's not possible uh, you know the reality is that if you build yourself that level of control i just finished reading the the biography of edison same problem. Yeah. You build that level of control, it will be taken away from you because you know what? Humanity is not going to pay that kind of tax. So you have to be really more than generous in your sharing of the wealth because this is a benefit that, you know, 
really is being bestowed upon humanity. And when you bestow that kind of benefit, you have to be very generous. And it pays to be generous. It, in this case, it really does pay to be generous. So I think that what uh, Holmars has come up with is the real deal. It is the model. And you know what? It's taking the North American NACS right. uh, model yeah. further. It's a great model, and it's a great international model. Yeah. And so Tesla, I mean, this uh, f uh, furthers the mission. That's what you're just saying, right? It's always the mission. Try to get as many self-driving cars out there, electric cars out there so that, Indeed. and then it's going to be the fastest way to, you know, instead of selling the car individually, do this. Um, what do you would expect? I mean, based on his language, it still sounds like there hasn't been a company that stepped up and says, let's talk about a partnership. Or do you feel like, that's why he's saying this, that maybe there's already conversations that are happening. I don't think there are conversations happening yet. I think we have to get to the point, we're almost there, we're on the cusp of the point to say, hey, it's solved. It really, really is solved. And we'll talk about that. We're on that cusp. If we're at the point where 12 point, and you know, I've driven 12.3.3, just before I left, um, there are still there yeah. are still levels to solve. We're close. I know that it's very rapid from this point. And by the way, that's a threat to Tesla because if it's that rapid, then there is a solution out there that you know with with the data can be solved. So that's the reason. By the way, a, another compelling reason to go ahead and license it, but. I think we're close. Somebody asked me the, I, I think it was just yes, a couple of days ago, you know, mm -hmm. where are we in full self driving? And I said, look, I, I used to say one to three years. Yes. <laughs> I'm not saying, you know, somewhere between one and two years. And yeah. we're going to see it, thankfully, I now in my life, hopefully, now in my lifetime. Oh, so right now, yeah. I think it's happening. And I think, we're at a position now where these license deals will start to make sense to start talking about. And, mm -hmm. you know, hopefully it's going to be Ford, you know, my favorite uh, partner company for Tesla. And I think uh, it's going to happen this year. So, you know, I've been testing uh, full self-driving since I think one of the first 2000 people that's ever tested it. And uh, for all these years, I would just test it when it comes out. I would stop using it. I would never use it. And uh, everybody's like, oh, what? You don't use FSD? I use it all the time. I, I just think it too many problems. Yeah. I just received 12.3.3 three days ago. And every single drive, even with my spouse and family in the car, I use it. And now I'm thinking, I don't want to go on a ride without it. Because yes. it drives just like I do. Um, and and it is you know it's it just feel like it's safer. So and I'm now at the point where I actually don't want to not drive with it in everyday driving. That's a big move for me because I was so I just couldn't handle it previously. So let's uh, let's okay. So we're that, that's the next big thing a licensing announcement. Um, I, I I'm one of those who thinks it's going to happen this year. I sent out a note and I asked you know through post, and there were people that were saying. 0% chance that a license will happen this year. I just don't understand that part, but um, we'll see, right? We'll see what happens. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about the moat. Does Tesla have a moat? And what about these other companies? So Frida Duan works at Altimeter Capital. Uh, Brad Gerstner, who is often on All In Podcast, he's a, a VC, Altimeter Capital, and she's uh, works there too and they and she had a couple really good posts and then we'll we'll do the second one later but the first one here tesla's moat and self-driving so the self-driving space has been a battleground of ideas right so do you do lidar or do you just do cameras do you do a rule-based end-to-end -end, or do you do oh sorry rule-based which is you know heuristic codes or do you do end-to-end -end neural network a lot of dead bodies with new entrants keep coming as FSD pivots to end and end, end to end, there are a lot of discussions around its moat. Why can't other OEMs get there? What about NVIDIA or Mobileye, right? The Chinese EV makers, what about them? Are they competing? And like you said, it's, oh, this is something that everybody can maybe do in the future. How long? So this is a fantastic 
chart that she put and she said, okay, there's the people that are vision only and there's people who are LIDAR. And then there's the people who are still rule-based versus the ones who have already moved to an end-to-end -end neural network that Tessa did two years, a year and a half ago. Tessa's the only one today that is camera-based, vision only, and end-to-end. -end. Here's all the companies that are doing LIDAR-based, right? So you got Cruise, Waymo, NVIDIA, and the Chinese EVs, they all still using LIDAR base. Now there's a lot of them have made announcements since last year that they're testing to do vision only. Only Mobileye is doing vision only. But now you can't just be doing vision versus LIDAR. You need to be do, have sw switched to an end-to-end -end neural net because that's the one that's shown to work. And so here's the comment that so far no one has done this. I've, we've heard last week that both Li Auto and uh, Xiao, uh, Xiao Peng and now are uh, there's rumors that they are now dropping their rule base and they're going to start moving to an end-to-end -end solution. Um, but, you know, and of course, they, they need to drop their LIDAR too. Um, yeah, what, what's your thinking about this table? This is a brilliant table. It really is. Um, I think that every one of these competitors have opportunities to improve, including Tesla for that matter. Um, but every one of them have an opportunity to move up and to the right. The problem is psychological. This notion that you have to have more senses, this opportunity, this notion that you have to have, you know, LIDAR, that you have to have radar, that you have to do this DAR and that DAR. It's an issue. The problem is not hardware. We know how to measure to the millimeter in real time. That's not the problem. And it turns out, by the way, that you can do it in, in, in the camera. The, the problem is processing. And the more of these sensors you have, the, the more complicated your processing becomes. And, you know, the move from heuristic code to pure neural net has been magical. I was very skeptical. You know, I'm, I was one of the guys in the skeptical camp. I admit I was wrong. Um, and it's been pretty amazing to see, you know, to actually feel the result in driving the car. So I'm aligned 100% on the sensor issue. I'm aligned 100% on the software issue. Now the question is, can anybody get there? Can Mobileye get onto enough vehicles? Can they get that data? Can they, can they actually get to, you know, the right-hand side? Once they're up where they are, that's the one question. Can those guys in the bottom left-hand corner, you know, shed their preferences for, you know, these multiple different sensors? Can they move up and to the right? It's an open question. Tesla's there. The rate of improvement that they now face, that they now have the opportunity to achieve given the amount of um, processing power that they now have. Remember, you only have to look at their processing power map to see where they are. They're moving up and to the right at an incredibly rapid rate. They're, you know, they're in an S-curve. They're on their way up. They, they, have no they don't have constraints, according to Elon right now, in terms of uh, uh, processing power. So it's going to be darn hard to build the processing power to, you know, get rid of all those sensors, to get rid of all the code and to move to neural net. I would be amazed if NVIDIA doesn't make those moves in the next six months to a year, but they have to work through third parties. They have to, you know, get agreement. And then the question is who owns the data? There's a lot of problems there. Right now, this is Tesla's world. This is exactly the point. Now, I'll we'll cover more about what she said, but there's the hardware, there's the software, and then there's the data. So the hardware, clearly, you know, only Mobileye made the decision right, but even then, they don't have the same hardware that Tesla has. And then for some reason, these guys all thought LiDAR, and they're now realizing it's not. They're now making moves to the right hardware. And then the Did move to end-to-end... You know, end, there's another factor that's not on this diagram and it needs another axis, and that's data. You've made the no, point. We're going to cover that. Yeah, we're going to cover that. She spent a long time describing this, and that's my point. You got, you got hardware, you got software. Now let's talk data. So data, and here's what she said. Data stands at the heart of this discussion. While the importance of data volume and quality is widely recognized, 
people are not talking that you also need to be aware that the type of data and it's, and how easily accessible that you're saying NVIDIA may not how easily accessible to access that data is often, often overlooked. So the right type of data is crucial, right? Tesla has nine cameras per car, while most existing fleets on the road have one to two of different quality. Although NVIDIA sells 1 million units of uh, Orin chips annually and mobilize IQ chips have 70% penetration, most of the installed vehicles don't produce the right kind of data for training. This is, again, right. people think, oh, NVIDIA's already got so many chips out there, but they're not getting the right type of data. Now, access to that data is equally critical. The presence of cameras doesn't guarantee that you get usable data, which much with much of it not being saved or simply disconnected. So even when data is stored, Third parties like NVIDIA and Mobileye face hurdles using it in real time. That This was what you were saying. And of course, volume of the data matters and the quality. So Waymo, rumored to be also pivoting to end-to-end, -end, struggles with less than 500 vehicles because they're using the LiDAR, they're so expensive, they're geofence, and under 10 million miles of data. This is not to underestimate the internal execution and organizational challenges of removing 300,000 lines of code. So for them to switch from lines of code to neural net was, which is what Tesla did. It's not easy as you think, oh, Tesla did it. We can copy them and likely a complete reorg. The potential customer. Mm. I guarantee there's one thing wrong in her statement. Okay. I guarantee that Waymo has way more than 300,000 lines of code. Waymo. Oh. <laughs> yes. That's why its name is Waymo. Waymo. <laughs> Waymo. Oh my God, I'll never get that off my head anymore. <laughs> Waymo means Waymo code. You're right. You're right. If this is what Tesla did, it's very likely that a company like Waymo, although they're they're Google, this is Google DeepMind. So you you know, but you're right. Um <laughs> and, and by the way, DeepMind and Waymo yeah. are like they're not oh, really? sisters, they're not even oh. cousins. They're oh. like third cousins twice removed. I didn't realize that. Yeah. Okay, so Potential customers, then, are competitors. They face three hurdles, the right type of data, accessing that data, and achieving sufficient volume and quality. So this screening process effectively sidelines most existing fleets and creates obstacles for third-party providers like NVIDIA and others. New electric vehicles might meet the first two criteria, but their fleet sizes fall short. So BYD stands out as a potential well-positioned player, albeit without a clear focus on autonomous driving so far. They've not said what they're going to do there. NVIDIA versus Tesla in some ways mirrors that of Qualcomm versus Apple, right? NVIDIA leads in chip design, but lacks Tesla's level of integration and ecosystem control. Players like Li, Auto, Xiaopang, and Neo all use NVIDIA's chips, yet they're developing their own self-driving algorithms in-house. So as the industry gravitates towards end-to-end -to -end approach, Tesla's moat actually seems to be widening. Let's pause there. What do you think about all that? So this makes a lot of sense to me. I think BYD may have, you know, a, a private group under underground working very hard at it. But I think they're a natural partner for Tesla. Look, they're partnering with Tesla on batteries. I think they're a natural partner because, firstly, they have the have the means to manufacture. They have the volume of vehicles. They have a lot, a very large volume of vehicles. Um, and you know, this is this would be a natural move, just as Ford is a natural move in the United States, BYD would, a would be a natural move in China. And a Chinese partner is very important for Tesla in China. Tesla has to move very judiciously in China, and a partnership with BYD would be just such a ju ju judicious move. So my ideal scenario would be a partnership with Ford as a start of, you know, bringing all the OEMs on board as we've done with NACS and a partnership with BYD as a first step towards a partnership with several to many Chinese OEMs. And the other partnership that's a natural is Volkswagen. We haven't spoken about Europe. Europe's a very important market. You know, it's the third largest market. Maybe it'll become the fourth largest market, but right now it's the third largest market. And the opportunity uh, to solve Volkswagen's problems with software is very large. It's very large indeed. So ideal. 
And and then of course there's Hyundai here in Korea. There, there there's the roadmap. Whoever the partnership <laughs> manager at is, yes, there's your roadmap. <laughs> I love it, Larry. I hope that this is true. So Ford first. Imagine if BYD. Imagine that, right? That would just be like you said, solidify. This is the standard. Everyone needs to jump on this. It's too yeah. late. That the market is too big of electric yeah. vehicle plus self driving. If BYD doesn't do self-driving, they probably can see that their lead completely. They need to do this. The only concern I have with that one is China. You know, China is concerned about giving away the self-driving technology. Having said that, Tesla is in China. Tesla is viewed by Chinese, the Chinese government as a Chinese company because 99% of their business is in China. But the software part, I, I wonder. The Tesla relationship with China has been incredibly successful for China. And it's been incredibly successful for Tesla. That partnership enabled China to transform what was a stuttering move into EVs into a rocket ship of EVs. That partnership really paved the way and, and Tesla gave them the roadmap. They were, you know, they were trying to do these deals of, with giving special uh, amount of money to these guys to manufacture cars, and they managed to manufacture these junk cars. Tesla went there and said, this is not the way to do it. This is the way to do it. They adopted Tesla's method, and the result has been amazing for yeah. China. Amazing. So... This is another pattern of success for success for China. And people keep pointing out to all these videos that Chinese EV makers are releasing about their FSD version, and they're going, look, they're just going to catch up. But you saw here, many of them have LiDAR. Many of them have supervised driving, like uh, as in a teleoperator from a human. Many of them don't have the data. None of them are doing neural nets yet. A few have announced it last year, but they're, they have, you know, they're still catching up. It's so, going to be very difficult for China yeah. to, and it's going to be very difficult for Tesla if they do not license it to China. Interesting. That's a good point too. So you've said, okay, you said it here first. I'll keep this in mind. You said you think it's going to be Ford first, BYD next, Volkswagen, and Hyundai Kia. If those happened, you just had yet again predicted the future like you've done so many times here. So let's uh, finish off Rita Dunn because she had yet another nice post a few days ago that was quite interesting. So she was re responding to when Tesla's offered the free trial of FSD across all feeds. And she wanted to calculate what does it mean to Tesla's earnings. So have not seen this pace of development at Tesla for a long time. There's continued improvement in FSD. Offering the free trial across all fleets, even better if there could be more flexible pricing, as you were saying, could greatly unlock value. So let's, she walked it us, walk us through it. Existing U.S. fleet, there's 2.5 million vehicles in the U.S., currently at a 15% FC attach rate, 400,000, right? Uh, assuming a 10% increase in attach rate from the free trial with a mix of the monthly subs and the, you know, one-time purchase, what it will do is it will lift earnings per share by 10%. So 10% of the consensus for fiscal year 24 earnings per share of $3 to 30 cents, just 10% of the earnings per share. The new vehicles, assuming there's 2 million units sales and US FSE attach rate increased to 25%, the implied earnings uplift is 20 cents per share or 6% of the fiscal year 24. So 16%, um, which is not nothing, but it's not, it's not going to be great. She says the attach rate, of course, it depends on the pricing and the near-term profits. For Tesla, prioritizing the adoption rate over pricing is essential. So she's saying, you know, don't try to do this because of getting more margin. Just do it to get as much adoption as possible. Because unlike other technologies, like even in ChatGPT, right? FSE has no current or foreseeable competition. It has a ton of pricing power in the mid to long term, but customers need to be locked in. So price it low, get as many people in, raise the price later when, you know, before anybody even shows up at all. So but without these discounts, on the, without discounts, U.S. will have 0.8 million FSC subscribers out of the 3 million units by the end of this year. But in assumed 50% discount, FSC subscribers can hit 1.5 million. So instead of uh, 0.8 million, it can go to 1.5 million if you do a reduction. 
What's your thoughts on that? I'm entirely aligned. I think that FSD pricing has not been as creative and as um, as productive as it could have been. I think it's been too high, and I think it's been uh, too unforgiving in terms of the ability to transfer it on sale, the ability to, um, you know, I, I gave myself as an example, I'm $48,000 into FSD with the four cars I've owned, one of which I've already sold, and lost my FSD, the other I'm about to sell, lose that FSD. So I left two cars in which I've paid $48,000 for FSD. I don't think that's a great deal. I love FSD and I'm very supportive of the program, but I don't think the pricing is fair or reasonable. Her idea of pricing is much better. I think we'll get to 12, I think we'll get to 16,000 under reasonable terms and conditions. I think we'll definitely get to $200 a month, but I think a, a, a more constrained pricing model, a more liberal pricing model will be much, much more productive. And I think we'll get a huge adoption rate. I don't care about earnings per share. I really don't care about earnings per share in 2024. What are we in 2024? I don't care. 2025, I'm not that crazy about either. I'm very concerned about 2026. And when you're going for that long term, you really have to think about that long term. There's no doubt that FSD is worth $12,000 or $16,000, no doubt at all. But we have to get, you know, global usage of the product, global usage. And so we have to be a lot more forgiving, a lot more liberal, and a lot more creative. So her, what, what she's suggesting is one way. I think there are other possible permutations, but we have to be much more liberal and much more forgiving. I'm I'm in line with that as well. Just get this out as as much as possible. Now that it's actually enjoyable to drive 12.3.3. Now that um, even significant others are being very impressed by this. Now that there isn't that many potential critical, <laughs> critical disastrous maneuvers that the car might do out of the blue, it can still happen. But uh, it needs to be supervised. Well, now that we're here, yeah. though. Mm. Herbert. The current version of FSD is an incredible selling tool for exist for new Teslas. Yeah. We could be using FSD to improve the demand for Teslas, which we really need to do right now. And and not even talk about full self-driving. We could be talking about this as an incredible incentive to buy Teslas because this is a function that is unavailable on any other vehicle on the road anywhere in the world. And, you know, people say, oh, so-and-so's got level four. Nobody's got, nobody's got level two. Nobody's got level one. I mean, you can drive for, you know, five kilometers on a, on a freeway. I've done that before with blue, whatever. It's I mean, it's not even the same. You can't use it in the same sentence. It would be wrong. So, we could be using FSD for really as a sales tool. We're losing that opportunity. You know, just two days ago, Tesla actually asked uh, the public, send me your best FSD version 12, point, you know, videos. And we're going to collect it all. I think they're doing that because they're going to collect and do a collate and then actually do an advertising or some sort of, you know, Damn. pitch on that. We'll see. But it was, it was fun. It's, there's a reason they did that. Um, but, so the last but, part but here... Price it accordingly. Price it accordingly. Here's a very interesting paragraph, the last paragraph of her tweet. And she said this, investors have been eagerly looking for large scale AI applications to justify the massive GPU spending and appears we've just found one. Bingo. So this is, this is the comment that, you know, many, many AI companies have, you know, just AI boom, right? Every excitement about AI is going crazy. You've seen companies like large language models and, you know, ChatGPT, DeepMind, rock everybody coming out this the thing with them is they're spending so much money and so much excitement but they're spending so much gpu spending but they haven't yet come up with a revenue model something that's actually going to deliver them enough revenue 
uh, Stability AI just announced that they might actually go bankrupt because they spend $100 million and they only make a $2 million of revenue. Where are they going to make this money? Here you, you go. Know what, you, you know yeah. what nobody's spoken about? Nobody's spoken about the cost of inference on these large language models. Yeah. The cost of inference, it turns out, is bloody high and unsupportable in the models that, you know, Microsoft and Google and, uh, well, Microsoft and OpenAI. Mm. But the cost of inference on FSD is negligible to zero because it's running all the time in the car anyway. There's no cost to it. There's zero cost to that inference. And look what you're getting. This is, you know, this is the dynamite, the dynamite application. Yeah. So we, we just got to get into people's hands and we got to get the excitement going. Look, there are 4 million cars, well, 2 million cars in the United States, 2 or 3 million cars in the United States. Give it away for, you know, $5,000, $6,000. Give it away for four thousand dollars. Get it into two and a half. Get you know ten billion dollars to get it into two and a half million cars. It will be game over. Yeah, you were saying earlier that for every inquiry that I that people make on ChatGPT, for every time I ask it a question, it costs them ten dollars or even higher, right? More. And so that I don't know how they actually make their money back. Um, versus here, like you were saying with FSD. It really is an AI company, and yet <laughs> we get all these people saying that uh, Tesla is not the AI company. It's these guys that are more exciting. And here's real world application. It's just mind boggling that people haven't seen real this world or can understand it. Economic that. application. I mean, yeah. that's the piece she's missing there. That not only is it real world, you know, it not only is this the killer app, but it's a killer app because it's so economical. I mean, think about the work it's doing. It's not one query, you know, and you're paying all this money. It's like constant on, always on, running yeah. that car. It's amazing. It's it's like yeah. the miracle of miracles. So, you know, get into yeah. everybody's hands. Just get it out there. I think we have a great winner here. Great, great show today. I mean, obviously, we covered quite a bit of ground. We talked about the new FSD business model, licensing it, and you're in favor of not, uh, you know, not having to charge the OEM. <laughs> you said that you believe this is your guess, but it's fun. You said it's Ford first, maybe BYD next would just be killer. Then you think Volkswagen and then Hyundai Kia. I, I, I think that there might be some very small players like a Mazda and Honda, like they'll just come in, maybe not the Japanese, but a small player because you know what I mean? Like they, they got to move, they got to survive, they got to live and they don't, you know, they have less of a air issue. We talked about that. We talked about, um, the, the, the moat that Tesla might have has for sure, because of not only the hardware, the software, neural nets and the data, there's so much issues. People, I was glad that I did it because I myself did not know this detail of, you know, which companies have access to which things. You kind of believe people when they go, oh, NVIDIA is like a big competitor to Tesla's FSD. Well, maybe, but maybe not. <laughs> you have to kind of dig deeper. Um, yeah, in the long term, NVIDIA could be a fearsome competitor if they were to adopt the approach that Tesla has taken. Mm -hmm. The problem with NVIDIA is they make a heck of a lot of money on their chips. Mm -hmm. So whereas with the Tesla chip, you have a very economical process, inference processor, with the uh, NVIDIA chip, not only do you have this enormous uh, tax that you have to pay NVIDIA for that processor, but the amount of draw, power draw that that processor has is very significant. So Tesla has the opportunity, and this is where everybody makes the mistake. They say, oh, Tesla can have a monopoly, they can be the... No, they can't. Whatever Tesla's done is doable by these other people if they would adopt as she said, you know, the cameras and inference, uh, and, and sorry, and um, neural net, neural net uh, end to end. And believe me, NVIDIA has the skills to do it, but they also need the processor. Tesla has the whole package ready to go. Now's the time to hit it. And don't be, don't yeah. be, you know, narrow minded. Don't grab the money. 
up front, gr grab the market, make it possible for people to actually participate in the market. Now be generous. That's Love it. it. Thank you so much, Larry. Follow him on X, Tesla Larry. <laughs> Check him out. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. I've created a website that is the most comprehensive resource for the Tesla investor. Please check it out. Simply go to my website at herbertong.com.